All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our EAB meeting. I'm glad to see we have a, a crowd here. Garden City loves their tree, so only fitting that people show up for this uh, that people show up for this great introduction of our new village arborist. We're thrilled to have him on board, Joseph Umana, and he has prepared a presentation. Um, the EAB has, I think it was probably two years ago that Kelly Smith put together a tree presentation that many shared. Um, it's you know an issue that people feel strongly about, and we're really um, excited to uh, have an arborist uh, on board now and we're looking forward to great things. So welcome, and I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit about yourself and the information you're going to let us know tonight. Thank you. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good evening. Uh, I'm a little nervous, I have to be honest with you. Uh, I, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm honored to be here. It took a long time to, uh, to get here, um, but I definitely have some nerves right now, so, uh, so forgive me. Um, <clears throat> so as the mayor said, my name is Joseph Humana. Uh, I grew up here on Long Island, born and raised Nassau County. Um, I grew up in Levittown. I, uh, I attended high school at, uh, Kallenberg Memorial, which is right down the road, um, which is where I got my start in, uh, in landscape design and horticulture. Um, so when I was a sophomore, uh, the vice principal would come into class and hand my friends, uh, paychecks. And so I didn't really understand what was going on. And so, I wanted to know, you know, why is the vice principal handing you guys paychecks? Oh, well, we work here on the weekends. So I, uh, I pursued a job and, uh, and I walked into uh, uh, one of the brother's office and I said, you know, I, I'd like to, uh, to work here on the weekends as, as part of the landscaping crew. And he said, okay, sure, you know, come in and, and we'll give you a job. So uh, the rest is kind of history. Um, from then on, I just, my passion for horticulture and working with my hands, uh, working with trees just grew. And, and I knew that it was something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, I knew that it was something that, uh, that gave me a purpose. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, uh, an office job was not for me. You know, I'm, I'm very, you know, clean cut and I present myself well, but when I'm out in the field, I'm a different person. I'm, I'm an animal in the field. And so, I need to know, you know, certain roles and where I belong and, and, you know, how I can be around certain people. And so, you know, uh, I couldn't picture a life in an office all day. It was not for me. It was not for me. This is not the person that I am every day. Um, so I, I needed to be out somewhere, you know, with trees and, and doing something that I love to do. And, and so I, you know, I said to my parents, I said, uh, you know, I, I want to change my major. And um, they said, well, what do you mean? Why? Like, you know, you, you haven't even gotten to school yet. And I said, yeah, but I don't want to go for business. I don't want to go for hotel restaurant management. I want to go for landscape. And so my mother looked at me and she said, you want to go to school to cut grass? And I said, no, ma, <laughs> not to cut grass, to, to design, to, you know, to leave my, to leave my imprint on this world. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I pursued a, uh, a degree in horticulture and plant science. Um, I went to the University of Delaware, uh, where I graduated with a bachelor's um, in science and horticulture and landscape design. Um, when I got out of school, I came back here to Long Island. Oh, excuse me. When I graduated, I went down to Walt Disney. I worked uh, a two-month internship with their professional internship down at Walt Disney World. I was in the Magic Kingdom. Um, and, uh, um, you know, when they looked at my resume, you know, they didn't even interview me. They called me and they said, if you want the job, you have the job we want you here. So uh, I went down to Walt Disney. Uh, Florida was not for me. Um, like I said, I'm an animal and those people move two paces slower than I do. So uh, I had to come home to New York and that's what I did. Um, so I came home to New York. I worked for a couple local companies um, here on Long Island. Uh, and then I, uh, I found a, a really good job with, uh, with a local company, um, guys right here in, in Garden City, uh, Harder Services. Um, I worked for them for about eight years, uh, where I ran most of their um, New York City operations. Um, you know, I, I ran all of their big major installs, um, uh, all of their maintenance accounts. And I mean, you know, I'm talking about millions and millions of dollars worth of projects. You know, th that's the arena. That's the world that I come from. 
You know, it was it was high pace, it was high pressure, and it was a lot of money. Um, and those people, they want, you know, they don't want things tomorrow. They want it yesterday, you know, and you don't move fast enough. You know, I, I had people call me at nine, 10 o'clock. I want X, Y, and Z at my apartment tomorrow morning. Well, it's nine o'clock. How am I supposed to figure that out? So that is the world that I come from. That's the arena that I come from. So, you know, I, I understand what it takes to uh, provide service to, to, you know, be on top of your game, communication, you know, that's, that's what, you know, that's what I know. Um, so when I, when I, uh, my, I met my lovely wife, who's here in the crowd uh, uh, about eight years ago, also Garden City native. Um, and, uh, and we, uh, we bought a house about three years ago in, uh, in Suffolk County. And so uh, making the commute to, to, uh, to, to Hempstead and then from Hempstead to New York City was just a lot. It was a lot of uh, it was a lot of dashboard time um, and, and it started to weigh on our on our relationship. So uh, it was time to make a change. And so I, I found something a little bit closer to home, um, but it didn't really work out. And, you know, that's that's life. You know, you're going to you're going to find things that work and find things, you know, that that don't. And so uh, I went on, I worked for a couple of different um, companies after Harder. Um, I did landscape sales for a little while. I did, um, I did uh, more arboriculture, um, especially like consulting uh, for a company that was working with, uh, with New York City uh, street trees. Um, that was another thing that I did um, as part of Harder. I, I um, looked after a lot of uh, the installation of New York City street trees. Um, a lot of the trees that you see in the city, both on rooftops and on the streets, I had a hand in in planting, you know, and, and I, I can go there today and still see those plants and remember when I did that and, and you know, remember where I was when those plants went in the ground. Um, so um, on top of my on top of my degree, I'm also a certified nursery landscape professional. Um, I'm currently studying to uh, to take my senior um uh, senior certified nursery landscape professional exam. Um, obviously, I'm a, a certified arborist as well as municipal specialist arborist, um, and I'm currently studying to take my board certified master arborist as well as uh, going into consulting arboriculture as well. Um, so this stuff has consumed my life. It is, you know, it's what I do. It's, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, I wake up in the morning and I look at plants. That's that's what I do. This is what I do. This is who I am. It's my passion. It's my purpose. Um, and that's why I wanted to come here. Um, that's why I wanted to be attached to this place. You know, it's it wasn't for the money. It wasn't for anything but the glory. To, to look back 25, 30 years from now and be proud. To say, you know, look what you did. Something you left behind. You left your, your mark on the world, you know. People with the most money are the most miserable. Seriously. It does not buy you happiness. It does not make you happy. It does not give you purpose. This gives me a purpose. This makes me happy. You know, I, I, I can, you know, when I have conversations with residents about plants, about trees, and I can see the same passion that they have, that I have, it, you know, that's, that's what makes me happy. That's what consumes me. When I put my head down at night, that's what I remember. I don't remember the money that I made. Um, and that's what I'm after. That's what I'm here for. You know, I'm, I'm here to build something that I can remember forever, you know, and I'm not here to take part. I'm here to take over. Remember, remember that <laughs> I'm here to take over. Okay. I'm here to bring things back to this village. Okay. I have family in this village. My wife is from this village. My best friend is from this village. Remember what I say. I'm not here to take part. I'm here to take over. We're going to bring this place back. We're going to bring this place to the future. Okay, that's what I'm here to do. All right. That's what I'm here to do. We need new blood in this village. We need new blood. We need a new way of being. And that's what you're looking at. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. But it'll happen. I promise you. I promise you. I swear to it. And that's my story. That's what I got. Great story. Thank you so much. How lucky we are. I love to hear about your experience in the city too, like working with the urban, because I'm sure you've heard already all of our struggles with the plantings between the sidewalk and the curb cut. And that's something we've been talking about for the last two years. So um, you'll bring a lot Absolutely. of great information to us. So to that point, um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to, uh, you know, that's, that's my spiel about myself. Um, 
I want to kind of, you know, give you guys an understanding of what I'm looking to do, um, how I'm looking to take this place into the future, what I'm looking to change, um, and, and you know, what I'm looking to to improve on and make better. Um, so to the mayor's point, first and foremost, uh, if you remember nothing else from this meeting, just take away right plant, right place. And in this village, we have a lot of wrong plants in the wrong place. We have a lot of big trees where they don't belong in 30 inch sidewalk strips, causing all kinds of terror to sidewalks, to residents afraid that something's going to come down on their house. You know, all of these things, obviously, we didn't have, you know, a hand in when these plants were going in the ground, but these are things that we can change going into the future. You know, we want to start putting the right plants where they belong. You know, a pin oak can have a, a root flare every bit of eight feet wide. Why is it going in a sidewalk strip that's 30 inches? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And then when the sidewalk gets kicked up and we go ahead and remove the sidewalk or we cut away the curb, inevitably, what do we do? We remove structural roots. We remove roots, okay? Now, would anybody in this room feel safe if somebody went into your house and removed the structural beam and said, okay, go ahead, go live in it? Probably not, right? So why are we doing that to trees? Why are we doing that to living things? Okay, trees are two things. They're living organisms and they're structures, okay? So trees can, can live perfectly fine, but structurally, are they sound? That's what you have to ask yourself. Structurally, can they survive a, a, a superstorm Sandy? Can they survive hurricane winds? Can they survive all these things? Okay, we saw what happened during Hurricane Sandy. What did the Mott section look like? It looked like a war zone. Why is that? Because all of these big trees were coming down because they have no roots left. Because over time, their roots were cut away due to sidewalk being replaced, due to streets being replaced. All of those things, it's all cause and effect. All right, but we, we have to have an understanding. You know, there has to be an understanding of, of the science and the organisms that we're dealing with. We're dealing with living, breathing things. That's it. It's not like any other trade in this world. It's not like carpentry. It's not like metal work. It's not like electricity. You're dealing with living, breathing organisms. They need to be respected as such. If you do not, they, any plant be, can become a pest, period. That's the bottom line. How many residents do I talk to that a plant was plant, placed in the, wrong, in, in the wrong spot and the roots are not only disturbing their sidewalk, they've grown now into their water or they've grown into their sewer line? You know, All of these can, things can be avoided simply by picking the correct species and putting the right plant in the right place. Um, if you could please advance slides a couple. Okay, so next one, one more. Okay, so uh, currently Garden City is a home to approximately 12,000 trees, uh, including um, nine parks and numerous shared community spaces. All right, we also have a, tree commu uh, a community tree planting program that introduces 150 new trees every year. Okay, 150 plus new trees every year. Uh, right now, Paul and I are looking at another almost 70 trees that are going to go in the ground uh, this spring. OK, um, the reason why I bring those numbers up is because if you don't know this, we have four tree men. Four tree men, 12,000 established trees, 500 new trees went in the ground in the last three years, and we're looking at putting another hundred in the ground this year. OK, the ship is sinking and we don't even have Dixie cups. We need help. We need men. We need support. Okay, so moving into the future, that's what we have to think about. We have to think about, you know, how we can, um, um, you know, take care of not only established trees, but start working on the young trees. Um, because over time, a tree takes anywhere from 15 to 25 years to develop its structure, a young tree, 15 to 25 years, that's Every, each, every other year, you know, or, or every two years that a tree needs to be touched, it needs to be structurally pruned, it needs to be correctively pruned, rubbing branches, uh, multiple leaders, any type of defects need to be removed and corrected. If they are not corrected over the course of the time of that tree, what's going to happen? You're going to have branches that don't belong. You're going to have co-dominant stems. You're going to have co-dominant leaders. You're going to have all of these things that lead to problems later on, okay? So... Codominant stems, for example, tree is supposed to have a single leader and all of its radial branches are supposed to come off of that single leader. A lot of times in nurseries, that's corrected. If it's not corrected, you're going to have what's known as a codominant stem and you're going to have two leaders. Over time, both of those leaders are going to form at the same pace. The wood is going to grow at the same, at the same rate. 
and they're going to weigh and they're going to weigh and that's going to create a structural defect within that plant all of these things can be corrected if we're if we're on top of this early but we we need the help to get there all right so we need to take a proactive approach based on risk to the public and property we have uh, we've been going through the village, um, conducting visual inspections for dead and decaying trees and any hazardous trees in public spaces or along village streets. All right. So I've been doing this uh, personally myself. It's hard to believe I've been here for two months already. Um, I've gone through, you know, most of the sections of town and, and just finding, um, you know, hazardous trees, uh, trees that have, you know, structural defects, uh, any type of um, rotting wood or 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 fungus, you know, fungal bodies that are starting to form, anything like that is stuff that, um, you know, this, this system is, is unique because these trees are located in close proximity to, you know, homes, residences, uh, cars, all of these things. The, you know, we can't put a, a quantitative uh, a number um, of, of percentage to say, you know, I, I think it has a 50% chance of failing, or I think it has a 60% chance of failing. But what we do know is if it does fail, there is imminent danger just because of how close these trees are to things that they can hit and that they can damage. So that's, we, we cannot waste time and say, okay, we see fungus, but we can let it stay there for two, three years. No, that, that is not, that is not a proactive approach. That is a reactive approach because then something bad is going to happen. Uh, just this morning, we had a, a leader come down on Marillon Avenue. And thank God the resident's car was parked where it was because had it been parked a little bit further down the driveway, he would have had a smash car. His, his roof would have been smashed. His windshield would have been smashed. I mean, we're talking about an eight inch leader came down. Okay. Hazardous tree should have not have been there, should have been removed. Those things cannot persist anymore. We need to get rid of that. So right now, next slide, please. Thank you. So right now, we're going ahead and moving all of our all of our hazardous trees. That's that's the first, you know, kind of working from the ground up, getting rid of anything that's hazardous, anything that's dropping dead, uh, um, any type of dead branches or causing any type of uh, harm in any way. That's what we want to work on first and foremost. We want to make sure that our residents are safe. Uh, we want to make sure that our residents are heard and that they're taken care of. And to that point, our parks. So Garden City excuse me, is home to nine plus parks, okay? And we keep gaining new parks um, each, you know, every so often based on how these, these lands are being declared as new park spaces, et cetera, okay? So they're not only used by our residents, but also by numerous sporting groups and agencies, all right? The parks and fields remain a very large and important source of revenue for recreations and parks, as well as the village as a whole. All right, our parks also remain one of the highest traffic areas in the entire village, Upkeep, maintenance, safety pruning to remove hazardous branches and or trees is crucial, okay? Uh, the first time I walked through the parks, to be honest with you, I was a little horrified because there's dead branches, uh, fungal branches, things of that nature that are, you know, in places that need to be removed. We need to get taken care of, you know, over playgrounds, all of those things. That's, that's stuff that is crucial that we, that we you know, absolutely have to um, um, be on top of. Next slide, please. Um, so moving into our tree planting program. So our tree planting program going into the spring. Um, so, you know, a lot of credit to, to Paul Blake. Um, he's, been a, he's been a great um, um, resource so far. You know, he's been an excellent uh, um, boss, supervisor. I mean, anything that I have questions about, he, you know, he assists, he helps me with, um, you know, so I, I really owe a lot of, a lot of credit to him. But um, what him and I have started to discuss was um, incorporating more flowering trees, um, more, more uh, trees of interest into our tree planting program. Um, so specifically, we've been looking at uh, using cherries, uh, crepe myrtles, eastern red buds, amelanchia, and, uh, and some vitex chase trees as well uh, throughout the village. Um, so we've also been uh, discussing the use of new shade cultivars. Um, so uh, instead of using the the typical uh, Gladitia honey locust, Gladitia skyline, which is you know a large canopy um, honey locust, we're moving more towards uh, a street keeper uh, honey locust, which is a different cultivar. Um, it was actually uh, found by a friend of mine up in up in Buffalo. Um, it was uh, uh, used there as part of part of uh, Drave's Arboretum first, and uh, and the man that found it. Um, is uh is uh mr draves um 
So that tree um, will will you know still have the same uh, leaf uh, form as as a typical honey locust. That small you know that small leaflet, um, but instead of having this wide canopy, we'll have more of a columnar shape. You know, better for our streets, um, better for you know being near any type of vehicular traffic. Does not have the same type of invasive roots that disturbs our sidewalks. Um, so those are the types of changes as far as species that we're looking to make. Um, we're also uh, trying to move away from planting entire streets in a monoculture style. Okay, so what we've experienced, you know, first it was Dutch elm back in the 1930s, um, and even now uh, we are getting hit with you know new pests, new invasive pests every day. Um, so right now we're dealing with not only emerald ash borer, we're dealing with southern pine beetle out in Suffolk County, and we're also dealing with spotted and lanternfly. Okay, so. What ends up happening when you have a monoculture planted, if you have an entire street planted in a monoculture or the same plants and you have an emerald ash borer come in, we saw what happened in this village like that. Hundreds of trees got wiped out. So, you know, the, the, the tree, the tree canopy lined streets, they're beautiful. They're majestic. But we need to be very, very careful about how we approach that in the, in, in the future, because God forbid another pest comes and, and, and strikes out all of these trees and we lose an entire street of, of, you know, of this canopy that we all love so much, that's going to be devastation. All right. So that's what we need to think about going into the future. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So um, as we move towards the future, our oldest trees um, become our greatest assets. Uh, we need to preserve these trees as long as reasonably possible, um, as long as they pose no risk. All right. We need to develop a new approach with our selection and placement. Um, as I said before, with the increase and in explosion of world trade, we are rapidly seeing the introduction of new invasive pests faster than we can find methods of control. All right. Most recently, we've seen the explosion of emerald ash borer, spot and lanternfly, stud and pine beetle. And beech leaf disease, okay? That was another one that I did not even mention. I don't know how many of you are familiar with beech leaf disease. We know nothing about beech leaf disease. All we know is that it's caused by a nematode. That's it. That's it. We can kind of tell when the damage occurs by the striping in the leaf, but otherwise we know nothing. We don't know how it got here. We don't know how it spreads. We don't know how to contain it, and we don't know how to fight it. And we have hundreds and hundreds of year old beaches being removed daily because there's absolutely nothing to do about this pest. And that is what keeps me up at night going into the future because new pests are gonna come and this is gonna continue to happen. And that's why we need to be prepared. We need to put the right plant in the right places and we need to stay away from this monoculture style, okay? So the next point, planting in a monoculture style is gonna leave us susceptible to the next pest wreaking havoc, all right? Again, once again, please, if you take nothing else away, this next line, right plant, right place, and get away from planting large shade trees and 30-inch sidewalk strips, okay? Those plants do not belong there. I'm all for oaks. I'm all for big maples, but let's put them where they belong so they do not cause problems, all right? Over time, the root flares of these large trees are impeded by sidewalk and pavement. You know, as I said earlier, as their roots grow, the sidewalk is lifted, causing tripping hazards. When the sidewalks are then replaced, inevitably loss of structural roots will occur. With little root mass keeping a tree standing upright, we risk blow over and major damage during storm events. Next slide, please. Okay, so just getting into some of the uh, the species that I'm thinking about as far as um, uh, the spring planting and and moving into the planting into the future. Um, these are just uh, just a small variety of of flowering trees. Um, again, we're going to just start to introduce this, you know, slowly. Um, I, you know, less is more. We want to go with a a small plant palette, and then eventually, you know, uh, advance from there. So the first one we have here is uh, is a sergeant cherry, um, uh, Prunus sargentii. Um, it's a little bit different than typical cherries because it doesn't have that that weeping form that a lot of people are so familiar with. You can kind of see one of those in the in the back of this photo, the back left corner. You can kind of see a weeping cherry. So this is going to be a, a sergeant cherry. So this is going to grow more upright. It's going to kind of have that real tight columnar canopy to it. You can see it's got a real tight vase shape to it. It doesn't have that you know that big white, big wide canopy like we see in most of our shade trees. 
Um, so this would be, you know, a, a great style tree for a street tree planting. You know, this is, you know, a, a great style tree that we're going to start to introduce down Nassau Boulevard. You know, I mean, think about driving down Nassau Boulevard in the springtime and you see all of these light up, you know, the streetscape. I mean, that's that's gorgeous. That's what we're going towards, you know, and, and this was all, you know, part of Mr. Blake's idea and, and, and what we've been working on together for the last couple of months. Um, so this is a, uh, a crepe myrtle here, Lagostromia indica. Um, so what I love about crepe myrtles, a few things. Um, one, aesthetically, I mean, there's really nothing that gives you the show of a crepe myrtle. Uh, flowers profusely all throughout the summertime, multiple different colors. You know, di all the different cultivar names um, coincide with a different color. So this one here is Tuscarora. Uh, that's the first one that I want to start to bring into the uh, into the village. It has that that nice bright pink flower. Um, they also have uh, Natchez, which is white, Dynamite, which is red, uh, Hope Eye, which is a uh, a dwarf variety. Uh, so many different varieties of crepe myrtles, all flower. Um, and then the other, the other um, uh, aesthetic interest for them is the, uh, is the bark, is the, is the trunk. So um, you can find them on single stem. Uh, I prefer the multi-stems personally. Um, we are going to start to introduce more of the multi-stem variety into the village uh, rather than the single stem. Um, so they are multi-stem, meaning they are, they're they're going to have multiple leaders rather than rather than one leader, um, and they're also very showy in the winter time because so when they're planted young, they're going to have a real basic kind of uh, uh, gray outer bark to them, and as they grow, that outer bark is going to actually start to crack off, and underneath that outer bark, you're going to have this exfoliating bark where you're going to have multiple different colors. You'll have you know. Uh, creamy whites and browns and oranges, you know, so they're really a majestic tree, uh, multiple interests for all different seasons, winter, um, winter and summer. I mean, you know, it doesn't really get much better than a crepe myrtle. And you've only really seen them here on Long Island and, and, and up in this area of the country within the last 10 to 15 years. Because of why? Because of our climate changing, because of weather warming, because our, our winters are warmer and these plants can now survive here. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is Circus canadensis. This is a, a, a typical Eastern red bud. Um, this is, uh, you know, the the uh, the regular, you know, Eastern red bud that's uh, that everyone is familiar with. I would like to start using these as well, but I would also like to start using uh, specific um, cultivars, um, especially forest pansies. So forest pansy, I do not have a picture of it, but I can basically describe it to you. So if you look at the canopy of this tree, you see how that canopy is real, is real rounded, you know, real wide and rounded. The canopy of a forest pansy is actually going to kind of have more of a more of a flat canopy. So if you kind of look, you know, more towards like just where the where that tree is starting to spread out, where those radial branches are starting to spread, that's what a forest pansy is going to look like. So it's going to kind of come up and kind of have this spread out canopy. Uh, beautiful heart-shaped leaves, just like a, a typical red bud, but the forest pansy actually has purple heart-shaped leaves instead of green heart-shaped leaves. So again, multi-interest. Uh, the bark is very interesting as well. You have that heart-shaped leaf, you know, purple foliage, and then these uh, these pink flowers um, in the springtime as well. So to that to that point, um, I've showed you a couple different things as far as spring and um, spring and summer. So I, I, you know, I'm a student of, of landscape design. I went to school for landscape design. I'm also a landscape designer myself. Um, I, you know, I, I put together all of my own designs, installs, et cetera. Um, so I'm also approaching this from a landscape design aspect as far as, you know, having multi interests um, throughout the year. So, you know, having beautiful flowering cherries down Nassau Boulevard, and then in another part of town, as the cherries are starting to finish, the crepe myrtles are starting to push bud and then they start to flower. And then you're having, you know, interest all throughout the year. So we make this place a living, breathing arboretum. That's what I'm after. That's where we're taking this place into the future. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one here, another beautiful one, uh, criminally underused. This is uh, Amelanchier canadensis, shad blow, also known as serviceberry, another multi-stem tree. Uh, spring flowering, white spring flowers. Um, this one here is is a single stem, but they do most commonly come in multi-stem. Um, they have this really beautiful gray smooth bark to them. They come up in this nice wide canopy and have uh, white white flowers in the springtime. 
And then in the fall, they have a beautiful red uh, uh, fall color as well. So, and and this one actually is a is a native. This is a Long Island native. So this is a beautiful plant to start to introduce again for spring flower for residents that want native plant uh, material. Um, so another another uh, beautiful specimen that we want to um, start to include. Okay, and this is going to be uh, my last one here. So this one is going to be um, not so much for for street tree plantings, only because of the wide canopy that it has. It's going to kind of stay short and have that wide canopy. Um, so over time, I think that that's going to kind of impede on uh, on both vehicular and uh, pedestrian traffic. So I want to kind of stay away from that um, as far as resident planting, but I want to start to introduce this plant um, in common spaces, in areas that it has room to grow. Um, this is Vitex chase tree. You see these all over Fire Island, uh, big on Fire Island. Um, they have big, uh, fragrant purple flowers to them, kind of similar to a crepe myrtle um, in their appearance, but the flowers are a little bit daintier. Um, they are fragrant, um, you know, another multi-stem tree, you know, thin, thin um, kind of uh, uh, wispy branches into that nice, you know, wide canopy, but not a, not a super large tree by any means. Okay, and this is the uh, this is the street keeper honey locust. So the typical Gladitia skyline, uh, Gladitia trichanthos skyline, the uh, the the honey locust that you guys are all familiar with seeing has that you know that wide canopy. This street keeper, the the name, the reason why they gave the cult of our street keeper is because it's intended to be planted as a street planting because it has that columnar shape. It has that that tight canopy rather than this big wide canopy that's going to grow into power lines, that's going to, you know, grow into our roadways. And and you know, I mean if you look at the trees down Stewart Avenue, how many how many trees have wounds from traffic passing from from truck traffic, et cetera. You know, so over time, that damage is going to lead to decay, is going to lead to trees dying and, and needing to be taken down. You know, so I want to start to try to introduce stuff like this, you know, that has more of a, a tighter canopy that's not going to cause um, so much trouble on our roadways and to our pedestrian traffic. So a little bit about our pest updates. Um, so emerald ash borer remains uh, an issue and has decimated the population of the ash trees, not only in the village, but throughout New York State. Um, so Southern pine beetle remains an issue here on Long Island. His populations remain erratic. All right. So most of the damage is actually um, taking place uh, out by me in, in Suffolk County in the Pine Barrens. Um, they will attack all pines, uh, but for the most part, the most susceptible are actually pitch pine, which are going to be typically found near the water or beach, uh, beach style plantings. Um, they are used for beach style plantings because they are salt tolerant. Uh, so most of our pine here in the village are white pine. We do have some black as well. Uh, but we continue to assess for any damage in presence of populations. All right. Um, and beech leaf disease is associated with a nematode. Um, that is the scientific name right there. I don't want to say it and embarrass myself. Uh, so this disease has only been discovered in recent years and much about it, including the full cause and how it spreads is still unknown. Um, so if you do have a beech tree on your property and you, you know, think there may be a, uh, an issue, the way you can tell what you can look for is if you look at the leaf um, and you kind of take it and look at it from the underside through the sun, if you see striping in the leaf, you know that that tree has been affected by the nematode and, and more than likely will need to be removed. Um, and it's, it's sad because those trees have been longer than you and I, most of us put together. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's haunting to think about, but these are the things that we need to be aware of going into the future. Um, and the big one uh, that everybody wants to know about that everybody is asking about only because it's the most recent and, and you know, people want to know what to do is spotted lanternfly. Um, so the pest that's causing the most alarm and questions among our residents is spotted lanternfly. So it was first discovered about 10 years ago in, in, uh, in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania. Uh, the bug was then found in New York as of 2020, and populations have exploded since. All right, adults and nymphs use their sucking mouth parts to feed on the sap of more than 70 plant species. All right, this feeding, uh, sometimes by the thousands of, of southern lanternflies, stresses plants, making them vulnerable to disease and attacks from other insects. All right, uh, they also excrete large amounts of sticky honeydew, which promotes the growth of sooty mold uh, that interferes with uh, plant photosynthesis, negatively affecting the growth and, uh, and fruit yield of plants. Um, they will go after maples. They will feed on maples um, and, and, and other shade trees. 
but we have experienced and what we've seen um, from the agricultural department is that they've actually gone after grapes and, and crop more than anything. So if they start to make their way out to the North Fork, Suffolk County, your wine is going to go up heavily in price. Yeah, that's that's what we're experiencing. They're wiping out grapes by, you know, not millions, by the billions of dollars. So they're doing major damage to grapes and, and to agricultural crops. So management right now, uh, the DEC is working on, uh, um, is working with, excuse me, the Department of Agriculture and Markets uh, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, to address Southern Lanternfly. Uh, since it's less expensive and easier to deal with a pest before it becomes widespread, the goal is to find and treat uh, Southern Lanternfly infestations early. A uh, plan has been developed that describes how the agencies will detect and prevent further spread of Southern Lanternfly in New York. Uh, extensive trapping surveys have, are being conducted in high-risk areas throughout the state, as well in, as inspections of nursery stock, uh, stone shipments, commercial transports, et cetera. Um, so we actually, uh, myself and my men also go out. Um, we look for these things as well. Uh, we have found um, uh, in a few instances their egg sacs. Um, if you're not familiar with what they look like, it almost looks like uh, like dried mud or like putty. Um, and what they tend to do is they will actually lay their eggs on the underside of something, on the underside of a rock, on the underside of a bench, um, and they do so so that they're not easily found. Um, another reason why decaying, you know, dead and decaying trees need to be removed. If a tree is decaying and the, and the bark is slowly starting to come off, but it's not completely off, sudden lanternfly will go underneath the bark and lay their eggs underneath the, underneath that bark because they'll never be seen. And so... Plants not being removed, it's not being chipped, this wood is not being disposed, and those eggs are left to hatch, and, and we have more plants. So another reason why hazardous plants, um, trees need to be removed. The other thing we need to uh, think about um, is, is maintaining our weeds um, and, and weed tree species, especially uh, the tree of heaven. Tree of heaven is, is what this uh, pest breeds on. It breeds on the tree of heaven. So if you have tree of heaven in your yard or you see an area that has tree of heaven, tree of heaven starting to grow, please report it. Please let us know so that we can go ahead and remove it um, because that is actually where they breed uh, the most. And that is my story. Thank you. That was a great presentation. One question on the last, the tree of heaven, how would people identify that? Okay. So I should have put a picture. Um, I will, I will actually get a picture um, out to you that way. Maybe you can, you know, uh, put it in a, in a, in an article or something, but essentially it um, it's uh it's, it's kind of hard to describe as far as like the leaf pattern. Um, it's got a, like an, like a rounded, like tear shaped leaf almost. Um uh, multiple leaflets on, on one branch. Um, but it'd be best to, to get you a picture that way people really know well, what to well, look like. Along the yes. Yes. Because they're, they're weed plant, you know, they're, they're weed trees. So they kind of just, you know, once they start, then they take off and then they reseed themselves. So the people are receptive. Everyone's been doing recycling tips. I feel like there is an interest. People yeah. want to like, maybe we should have some tree tips or if there's something that comes up like that, where people sure. could help. Um, I think they'd like to know what they can do. We'll wait for yours. <laughs> Any questions from up here? I love crepe myrtle. So most of them only bloom on new growth. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe a little bit more care required. Yeah. But I love them. Just I'm thinking, to, oh my God, I, I don't have one in my, my own property because I'm going to go and prune that every year. Yeah, understood. <laughs> I mean, Every plant is going to require maintenance. You know, that's that's the bottom line. Um, I, what I think about crepe myrtles as opposed to these large shade trees is as they grow, they're not going to have these, these you know, huge, you know, seven, eight inch branches that really pose any danger to anybody. God forbid they break out and come down or anything like that. Any area you prefer to have some of these very large specimen trees? Some, some very big parks I actually like an impressive size tree. Absolutely. And and I'm I'm all for that. I mean, I I uh I was where was I today? I was over on um Sandy and Maria. 
um, and they they have some really beautiful uh, oaks in their in their courts, but they're actually planted far enough away that you have a full oak canopy. You know, when you look at the oaks in the Mott, you know they're they're they have the fifty foot you know sixty foot height, but their canopy is only 10, 15 feet wide because they you know they they're so close to another tree that they don't really have you know that full room to develop. You know, so again, you know, give the plant the the space to to be what it is. I would love to see majestic oaks, absolutely, but not in a strip like this. It doesn't belong there. That's like taking a shark and sticking it in a goldfish tank. It doesn't make sense. You mentioned arbor culture. What is that? Uh, the study of trees. So I, I had a question. So in your presentation and what Paul had said last year, um, that you guys are focused on hazard trees in public spaces and long village streets. Mm -hmm. We don't have the manpower to do the, all the people's properties. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if maybe you, you could uh, just speak a little bit about what it would be a good pruning schedule for residents. And maybe that's something we could think about maybe putting something more concrete plan together in the future. So, I mean, I'm, I'm all for that, but what scares me about uh, a pruning program for residents is residents taking it upon themselves to start pruning. Um, I just don't want improper pruning to start to take place. And then we have even more issues because there is such thing as improper pruning. You know, I don't want flush cuts to start to happen that are going to leave wounds, you know, that can cause, you know, disease and decay to start. Uh, I don't want uh, cuts to be made in the wrong spot, you know, in the middle of a branch instead of back to a bud. So all of those things take a little bit of of knowledge and teaching. If if residents want to have the conversation and 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 they're open to learning how to prune their own trees. By all means, I'm all for that. Well, I would think more like they would hire, you know, the um, uh, the tree companies to come and do it. Like when we do our property, mm -hmm. we don't. I don't climb a tree and do it. I have somebody do it for me. Right. Same thing, and you know, also the idea of um, pruning your trees to keep um, protect your house mm -hmm. not only from winterization, but for branches that can we said fall on the cars, they can fall on your house, do a lot of damage. They can let squirrels get in, they get into your house. I had that when I first moved into my property. So one of the things we did was we cut the trees back. So squirrels have, you know, still pretty good, but mm -hmm. and they have been in since. So it's more, I think, along those lines. I mean, you guys just don't have the resources to be able to go around to every house and say, hey, you know, this tree needs to be adjusted and this got to be cut back. That's what I was more thinking. How do we better educate the, the village so that they can kind of do some, I mean, most people, I think at, at this point, know the idea that you're not supposed to put the big trees and then, I mean, anybody didn't know new after Sandy, <laughs> they, okay, that was a bad idea. They, they found out. Yeah, they found out. And if you, like you said, I took the walk around um, the mod section and you could see where the windbreaks were and all the trees came down and the big trees. But the last hurricane, it was Isaac, which technically wasn't a hurricane, but the one before that was Gloria, which was 85. So those trees had a very long time to get very big. Mm -hmm. And now we've gone about 11 and a half years mm -hmm. without a big storm. Mm -hmm. And again, the trees are starting to get big again. And a lot of them, as you said, are the, are the wrong trees. Mm -hmm. So it's the same concept. How can we kind of better educate the, you know, um, the residents so they know, not so much do you do it themselves, but they know, hey, these trees need to be inspected. This is what you need to look out for. And maybe you should have your trees pruned professionally. I should have said that before, every X number of years. So to your to your point, um, whenever I whenever I get a phone call, I try to go out immediately and and speak to the resident and explain exactly what it is that I'm seeing and and you know try to kind of assess their fears and what they're what they're telling me and and you know tell them listen you know I I I don't see any type of signs of decay I don't see any you know uh, um, um, wounds or or things to be weary of. You know, um, and I'm all for, um, you know, educating residents on on to how on how to do proper pruning and, and how to hire uh, or what to look for in a tree company to do proper pruning. Um, because I think that what can end up happening is even if you hire a tree company, they may not necessarily have an arborist on staff. They may not necessarily have somebody who's really, you know, has the knowledge of how to make 
proper pruning cuts and, you know, and listen, I understand cutting a tree away back from the house, but when you're cutting into, you know, a branch that's, you know, six, seven inches wide, that's a lot, you know, that's a lot of, of work and a lot of stress for a tree to try to heal that, you know? And so then what you end up having is water sprouts start to start, you know, so I don't want to get into improper pruning and, and more damage being done than, than, you know, going the, the wrong way than going the right way. I mean, I think that, you know, right now we're, you know, we're, we're moving, we're moving at a good pace. I mean, we're, you know, we're, I have one of my men here tonight and he didn't have to be here, but he's here because he, you know, he believes in the system that we're putting together. He's known me for all two months and he's here, you know, because he believes in, he believes in what we're doing. You know, he believes, yeah. <laughs> Well, two two gentlemen, uh, you know, Mr. Gordon back there too has been, you know, a a, a great support for me. This is Christian. He's also on the food group. We're both starting to gel. Um, I'm out every day with these guys, and and I'm dealing with the residents. And uh, I report to Paul, and things are working out. Um, I, I, the, when I dropped my son off, my wife and I down in Baltimore six years ago, and we get off at Belt Parkway and then Peninsula Boulevard. You ready for the odd effect? Think about the city. Oh my God. Actually, you, you can't replace it. You can't replace it. Mm. And uh, I, as Joe said, if people are moving in the right direction, um, I think uh, what we put in almost three, 400 trees in the last three years. Almost five. Right. Almost 500, and just shy. I think we're starting, I think we're at least 70 trees, correct me if I'm wrong. We're going to be doing in house. Um, you know, uh, also the, the crepe myrtles. If you want to see a mature crepe myrtle, go to Garden Street where the mayor's sister lives. And we put it in about 20 years ago. And they're absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, we just put in 12 Sergeant Cherries. Um, all wanted Sergeant Cherries. I said, we're doing it. Put them on National Boulevard, and I can't wait for these things to come. Yeah. Well, just when everyone online can hear you, although I think it was a little earlier. <laughs> hey, I told you I'm shy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So, for example, we, we, we put in uh, a village green Belcova from the mayor's house. He was on the list of publications. Thank you. And right next to that is Madison Hill. So getting back to what Joe said, is Alcova was the right choice for that strip over there on Harvard. So we're going in the right direction. So can I add anything? Thank you. And thank you both for being here and for all the great work you're doing. Uh, one question I had was the tree plotter software. Are you finding that helpful? How's that progressing? Yeah, so uh, tree plotter software is excellent. It's awesome. Um, so actually, uh, the young man back there, Christian, uh, he was the he was one of the first to really kind of get introduced to it. Um, so he's been pivotal pivotal in in myself being able to learn it um, because he's sat down with me a couple times and really kind of taken me through it and showed me, you know, this is how you add trees. But yeah, I mean, so we're trying to, um, you know, again, there's. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work. And it's, you know, it's trying to figure out how best way to spend eight hours because it's not enough time of the day. So, you know, 
I try to get all my visual inspections done. Um, and then I'm trying to get on tree plotter and, you know, and, and punching in, you know, different parts of town. Um, but we want to eventually get to a system where everything goes through tree plotter. So every village tree is mapped out on tree plotter. So we can say, hey, listen, when was the last time? And, and to your point, when was the last time this tree was pruned? Okay, punch it in on tree plotter. All right, we see that it was pruned back in 21. Okay, it's been three years. Yeah, let's set this up. Here's a work ticket. Christian gets the work ticket. And now and now we go and boom. But it's going to take time to get there because, you know, we have to we have to physically enter each tree in. And, and the other thing about it is a lot of the information, a lot of those trees have come down. New trees have been planted. So, you know, it's really kind of starting from the beginning and, and just going through everything and making sure that everything is really up to date and, and firm and correct. Great. Do we have any questions in the audience? I know we, we said we'd have Q&A at the end. Come on up. I believe we have a landscape architect approaching the microphone. <laughs> Hi, my name is Celia Peterson. I'm a landscape architect, and I'm currently serving as um, chair of the Architectural Design Review Board here in town. I'm here with Lynn Poo, who also serves on on the ADRB, as we like to call it. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really glad uh, to finally meet you after several years of not having an arborist. It's, it's great because we really need one. Um, when we look at the plans that are submitted to the ADRB, you know, they also many times show us landscape plans. And so, you know, we try to um, get them to plant in an appropriate place. Um, and I'm specifically talking about something that we've been talking about on the ADRB, which is hedges that block the sidewalk. So we try to get people to plant this tall hedges far enough away from the sidewalk. So those of us who are walkers can <laughs> stay on the sidewalk and not be forced into the street. So so that's something we've been working on, but we'd like to work with you and, and um, come up with um, some ideas of how, how to handle that. And, and probably even more important is the safety of the intersections where people plant tall hedges. And if you're trying to drive, you cannot see around the corner and it's really hazardous. So um, some other places like Rockville Center do have um, building code provisions for, for and, fi and fines, penalties, if you uh, block the vision and they, they are very specific. So, so these are some of the things we're thinking about on ADRB and, and try to find ways to make it safer. So, um, and um, since I am a walker, I'd like to say some of these trees you're proposing are a little short and might need a lot of pruning so we can walk underneath them. But, <laughs> you know, I, I understand you're trying to uh, make it safer, but we also need to be able to walk underneath the tree. So, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Nice to meet you. And, yes, and uh, I'd like to get your contact information maybe absolutely. after we're finished. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we'll stay in touch regarding uh, whatever you need. You know. okay, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Any questions on Zoom? Oh, we got another one in the room. Come on up. Absolutely. Whatever you need, I'm here to help you. <laughs> Anyone else in the room with a question? Anyone else up here? Well, I'm going to, two things. One, I just want to just relate a story, my own personal experience with a village arborist. So in 2000, 24 years ago, um, we have my home, we have a, um, a stand of hemlocks, which as you know, HWA. So they were probably gonna, they were probably gonna come down. So I, 
contact um, the village arborist at the time. Actually, my wife did. I shouldn't take credit. She did. <laughs> um, and he's, um, it was Paul um, Dick, right? Mike Dick. Mike Dick. Mike Dick, excuse me. Uh, it was 20 years ago, uh, 24 years ago. Um, and came up with the program to spray the trees. And uh, all the trees, 24, 24 layers are still there doing really well. So, yeah, that this you know they said maybe maybe eight years it might last. So twenty four, <laughs> anyway. So, but the other, but that it's one related that story. So if you can work with an arborist, I I highly recommend it from my own personal experience. We also had aphids on the property. They they took care of that because I have I have hemlock, um, you know, no tree that um that had a problem but that went away as well. Um, this my question is on North Avenue, and I don't know which one you guys answered. It seems to be a lot of branches coming down. They're just just. Uh, this this morning, I was walking my dog, branches down on North Avenue. Now that is the uh, easeway for the Long Island Railroad. So are those trees there out of your jurisdiction? Well, I would just recommend you take a look by north. And, I guess you probably should do south as well. Mom, yeah, but take a look at north because, again, this morning, down again. You know, they weren't big branches, but it's always stuff down there. Yeah. There's also a lot of um, gaps along North Avenue, along the rail that there should probably be some plantings put there because people like animals could get in there or even young you know, children if they're just so it needs to be disciplined. Sorry. I did have the microphone, but I what I was saying is along North Avenue, there's a lot of gaps also in like the hedges that are there. And so it would be really nice to have, you know, a, a uniform hedge that would be there because if people, you know, an animal that's loose can go right to the third rail or young kids, you know, that are just exploring or something like that. It's also on 7th Street, the parking lot, 7S. We need help badly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have another two more questions in the room. I have an observation about the Long Island Railroad, which I think probably be up. I really think that they used pesticides. And let's face it, they were using chemicals that don't break down. So I'm wondering if the types of chemicals that they use for vegetation control have an effect on the plantings over there. And that's why I only do organic stuff on my property, because I, I just don't think um, it's worth it to the environment to start using these toxic chemicals. And, you know, they, they were using Agent Orange in the day um, before it was known as hazard. You know, I live in Belrose Village, and we had a number of people who succumbed to cancer who lived on Superior Road, which is right along the tracks. And that definitely was when the railroad used the the chemicals. So it might be worth it to do maybe a sample of soil to see what's in there and what the railroad paid for. Not the village, but the railroad <laughs> gold for. But I'm glad you're on board. I think this is a wonderful addition to our staff. And I applaud the village for going forward with this. Excellent. And your attitude is absolutely the best. Thank you. Thank you. the microphone. So I live in the Moss section and I like the big shade trees. So <laughs> selfishly, I hope we're not going to move away from them entirely. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have noticed in your, in going through the Moss section, we do have a very wide yes. medium strip, so we can support larger trees. Yes. And half of the moss section was planted with oak, the western half, and did you, I guess, notice mm -hmm. or knew that? Mm -hmm. So um, the eastern half of it never had any oak trees. And my block in particular has been decimated. It, it looks like we're going back to the treeless sensitive plains there. I'm on the last block of Huntington before um, Clinton. 
And for some reason, I've talked to Evelyn about this. Maple trees have been planted. They look great for a few years, and they die, like over and over again. I've been there 30 years, and I've seen so many trees come and go. And you just need to have a few older trees, and that's it. And is there some kind of vascular disease or something getting these young trees? Um, it would be hard. Sorry, thank you for your question. It would be hard for me to answer that without seeing the trees themselves and really kind of assessing the trees individually to understand what was going on. Um, I mean, if you want to give me a call, I'm more than happy to, to meet with you and take a look and see, you know, what's going on over there. I mean, maybe we could take a soil test of, of the area near your house, you know, but I have to see it to, to know. I don't, I don't like to shoot blind and, and give information Let's do it. But mine's already toast. It's already the top branches are dying, and you know it's only a ten year old tree. It's gonna be, it's gonna die over there. You can tell woodpeckers are at it, and there's stuff growing on it. Well, let's let's take a look. Give me a call tomorrow morning. We'll take a look. All right, I'm more than happy to help you. Thanks. All right, so we're at uh, nine o'clock which is an hour. Um, thank you so much. This is a great presentation. Um, we will quickly vote to approve the minutes from the last meeting. We had scheduled on here a discussion of potential Earth Day activities, um, but we are missing some of our key, two of our key members who wanted to chime in. So if anyone in the audience wants to stay afterwards or if you're online and share some ideas, we're trying to plan a great um, Earth Day or Earth Week for the village. All right, so thank you everyone for coming and thank you so much. Um, this was wonderful. Oh, I think that's presentation. Really, really great. Really great.